So great. So today is about uh, wearable health. It's about the potential for uh, wearable technology to make a real difference to um, people's uh, health, um, health outcomes, as they call it in the industry. Um, we can explore what that means in practice um, with, the help of the, with the help of the panel. So uh, we're joined today by um, four very um, august and esteemed uh, experts on this subject. Um, the first person to speak will be... Um, will be uh, Ivor Williams uh, in the glasses there. Um, and uh, Ivor is at uh, the design studio uh, Being and Dying at Fabrica. And just chatting to him before we came on today, um, it was very interesting. His particular interest is in a kind of more holistic view of health and where wearables might fit into that. Um, so I guess if you think that at the moment, a lot of the consumer wearables seem to be about performance, um, it might be fair to say that Ivor is quite interested in presence and and what wearables can do around that subject. Um, um, on his right is uh, Kuni. Uh, Kuni Hiratakai is uh, one of MIT's under 35 to watch. Um, and he's particularly interested in uh, flexible electronics, which he sees as being the kind of ne next wave of wearables and, and what, what that enables people to do. Um, on Ivor's uh, left there is uh, Duncan. Um, he's somebody who has literally reinvented the wheel, um, a, uh, a flexible, um, a foldable uh, wheelchair wheel. Um, and talking to Duncan, what he's particularly interested in is, is how do you, you retain the magic of technology um, but also make it very, very approachable for people. And so kind of keep that magic but also um, keep it um, something that people can really connect to. And finally, last but not least, uh, we're joined by uh, Gary Martin, who's the founder of the Light Log Project. Um, looking out of a filthy uh, window in the speaker room today, we, we commented on uh, seasonal affective disorder, and that's one of the things that, um, that Gary's particularly interested in. And I think, you know, from our point of view, um, what happens when you try and take technology out into the community is really, really um, interesting, and that's, that's Gary's particular interest. Each of the speakers is going to speak for 10 minutes, and um, then after that, hopefully, we'll have enough time for um, a discussion and some, some questions from the floor. And I guess just as my kind of opener, just to introduce kind of why I'm here, um, in my role at Digitas LBI, I'm a strategist, and I'm working on an innovation project with a, with a major pharmaceutical company. And we're particularly interested in what difference digital technologies can make sort of above and beyond uh, the drugs, if you like. Um, and I think you, we're looking at particularly at um, wearables at the moment, not because we think they're the answer to everything, but we're very interested in, in where the possibilities of the kind of quantified self movement uh, kind of meet the realities of longer lifespans and, and finite health budgets. So when you put this kind of technology into people's hands, um, how will they engage with it? How does it engage with people's real life problems and how does it add something? Because I think it's fair to say at the moment we're just at the first wave of, of this kind of um, technology. I think it's very grounded in innovation, lots of very exciting innovation that's coming out of Silicon Valley. But if you like, the challenge is to go from California to Croydon. How do you actually bring this kind of, um, this kind of technology into, into people's lives? Um, and move it from people who, who want to measure everything to people who are maybe less inclined to measure everything. Um, so with that kind of backdrop, um, that in mind, I'd like to hand over to, to Ivor. Hi. Uh, so thanks, first of all, for uh, Wearable Futures for inviting uh, me in the studio. Um, I'll just do a short introduction to the studio and to Fabrica. Um, Fabrica itself is kind of hard to describe, but you can kind of describe it as a, an Italian villa surrounded by a Japanese concrete bunker, which is a physically what it is, but it's also a design research center in Italy. Uh, it's a very kind of unique place. Um, so it's a good place for, for the studio um, to, to be founded. So. Uh, I lead the studio Being and Dying. And inside Fabricate, alongside uh, other studios, uh, which are, say, focused on code in the urban environment, um, politics in the networked age, uh, we work inside a sort of transdisciplinary studio, uh, working different, with different types of people to create experiment, experimental design and to investigate holistic health practices. 
So we design, build, and promote better ways to live and die. Um, the studio was set up in September this year. So the focus is on using Fabrica, uh, this unique sort of design space and workplace as in the physical sense, uh, in the, as an institution, as a design studio, as a, as a lab for which we can uh, do some interesting work. And one of the things that we kind of come back to, uh, Dan Hill, who's the CEO of Fabrica, and, and myself, is this question from Cedric Price, which is the idea of if technology is the answer, what was the question? And I think it's really pertinent when we're thinking about how we can tackle issues of health and living um, and the degradation of health in dying, um, especially when we look from a holistic point of view. So one of the questions that we kind of uh, found emerging for our studio was, in the broadest sense, how can we die better in the 21st century? And so when we look at the practices of the social and the physical and the spiritual uh, practices of dying in the Western world, they haven't really moved on since the time of these prints, which is the 1400s. We basically live until we die um, with little thought of preparing for it. So then it comes as a surprise, and then we're kind of gone. So the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, which is what these prints are from, was like this, this text and these illustrations used by uh, priests after the Black uh, Plague in Europe to help people prepare for their death. And it was a super innovative um, document because it was one of the, I mean, for one thing, it was one of the first books after the Bible to be used with movable type. And it was very controversial because um, it was, like most things appearing for the first time, it was established for the first time, it set this idea of a good death and how you could actually achieve a good death. So its motives um, and its original subtitle for uh, the, the text supplied us with a great way of summing up our philosophy, which is providing inspiration against despair. Uh, and we kind of think of this in lots of different ways about thinking about life in its perfect form. You know, we don't really exist in a perfect way of life. And um, uh, we can provide inspiration against death in its most brutal form. So we try and make something more human, more realistic, more tangible. So we do that as a studio, uh, so it becomes a place for research and inquiry rather than commercial work, say. Uh, one example uh, was a project we called Fabrica Mood, which was a one-day project where we used the existing systems of communication inside Fabrica, which is the iChat system inside uh, every Mac. And it was just a simple way of charting the mood of every uh, researcher uh, in, the, in Fabrica. So it was an experiment to understand and to collectively kind of understand how we all feel that day which is a nice way of kind of measuring collective well-being. And so our, our studio essentially thinks about being, uh, being alive, being well, being healthy, and also about dying and, and dying well. So we think about this in general ways, in more specific ways. Uh, and it's a difficult subject for some, uh, and challenging these kind of taboos are kind of very important. So it's, we think it's a very important way to help people. So I'm quickly going to describe three things that we have in the studio. Uh, two things are about being alive and one thing and some points about dying. So the first uh, project is Uji. Uh, I guess it's a code name. Um, but in terms of Uji is a meditation on time. Um, and it's a kind of res uh, response to the classic uh, death clock. So we wanted to build an aesthetic response to quite nasty watches and, and clocks that you can get that kind of signify the, your, your life counting down. So as an example of our multidisciplinary studio, because we use interaction designers and industrial designers in a very sort of nice processed way, um, what you can see is the, the technical prototype. Uh, and what it does is it detects heartbeats with a body mounted ECG, which transmits wirelessly, and it's interpreted by an Arduino board, which then transmits over an XB link to the clock. And the clock is controlled by a second Arduino, which drives the mechanism. So the movement itself is controlled by uh, electromagnets, which swing and kind of hold this pendulum. And what that allows for is a very natural movement. Um, so it, it's kind of a clock, but it's also not a clock. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because we think of the clock as this design archetype and the, the pulse and the heartbeat as a sort of very quantifiable measure of, of life. And so the pulse becomes this physical thing uh, connected through the clock. So this becomes a meditation on uh, being in the present. And I was kind of drawn to a lot of Zen thinking on time. And, and uh, Uji, maybe you can kind of correct me. I, I don't know. But in terms of uh, Uji translates as a lot of things, but uh, basically for the time being. 
and it's more important than what you're doing, it's the fact that you're doing it for the time being. So as a death clock, it's pretty simple because um, it's connected to your pulse when, uh, when it stops working when you do. Uh, because the notion of time second seconds counting down to your death is kind of very arbitrary and uh, abstract, this actually provides more of a clarity in, sort of a, a, in terms of what is defining what is now. So this is the clock itself. Um, it's constructed from ceramic. Uh, it's made locally in the Veneto, so, uh, but the electronics are made at Fabrica. So these two arms swinging back and forth. So the sensation of watching your own pulse is actually very mesmerizing and very, kind of, uh, very beautiful. And in terms of, it extends, of course, to a wearable in this, in this sense, in the form of a wristband, which can detect the heartbeat. Obviously, technically, it's not really there yet, but it kind of asks the question of whether there's something as additive, um, like a clock, which kind of shows that you are subtly alive and here right now. If the wearable demands your attention uh, at the physical, personal level, and I'd say it doesn't. Um, I'd say the wearable, in this instance, is almost invisible. And that's kind of an interesting idea for me, uh, the, the idea of technology taking a back seat to the application. And so we also been working different uh, projects and one of those are workshops. So we ran our first workshop uh, quite recently, which was a health workshop, where we brought in a holistic consultant um, who trained the fabricanti, the, the fabricanti, the researchers at Fabrica, um, into breathing methods and movement patterns. And so this is kind of really essential for me to discover new approaches to entrenched, uh, blocked ideas about sitting and moving and building kind of invisibly into design practices. So on level, it literally helps the Fabrica to sort of uh, to be a bit more healthier and to sort of get moving, but also test a different sort of design process, uh, which can be extended into this sort of booklet that we had. Um, and what is really interesting is the emerging essential skills to think about holistic health practices, so breathing, relaxation, posture, movement. And it's, they're actually right at the core of what we need to kind of overcome in terms of our sedentary lifestyles. But more than that, it's the idea that all life is training, and all life is exercise, and all life is relaxation. So not just 30 minutes a day, or not just three times a week, all the time. And the way that we do this is through a kinesthetic approach. So we're drawing from direct experience to inform our practice. Um, as designers, we should be looking to solve other people's problems. Uh, and one of the sort of core things emerged was the, this notion of know thyself. And it's obviously a very ancient idea, it's a very ancient phrase, but um, this research is kind of doing apnea training, so breath holding which on a physical level is a very difficult challenge to actually hold your breath and to, to see how long you can actually do, hold the exercise. But it suddenly becomes a mental exercise because you have to challenge your, uh, your, sort of your thoughts. So this, but this is all done without technology. So there are obviously masters and teachers out there uh, with lessons, but how do we communicate them? And how do we effortlessly transmit these ideas? And we use technology. So back to technology and health. So what do we see as important questions uh, about what we're doing with wearable technology and health? Well, for a start, we can't take the whole view of a person. Uh, we have to look at the whole idea of the person living and dying because we simply can't take the data with us when we die. And this is a sort of fundamental point in terms of where technology is going to be going in the future. So we have to design with a thanato sensitivity, which is basically designing things with the death of the user in mind. So designing systems, interactions, knowing that the person using it will eventually die. Uh, everything that will outlast is the network, the data, the, the devices. So as a studio, we're aiming to create a, a new art of dying, a new ars moriendi, if you will, where design is linked closely to the cycle of life and death and views it as a whole system. And so for us to have a good death, we need good design. So we can design systems that take into account the fact that our health will diminish uh, and help us to actually work into that cycle. So it can shift and change and help us when it's most important. So not just when you're relatively at peace, when you're at the peak of your fitness. We can use design and technology to help complete the circle and improve our life and death. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ivor. And now over to Kuni. <clears throat> uh, 
Hi. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk about wearable devices, especially my research focuses on the, the application of smart bandage for the health monitoring systems. So first I would like to show you the, the current technology of the electronic devices. So as you know, the, the current uh, conventional electronic devices are, are bulk and the solid, such as the camera, home, and the health monitoring systems. Uh, however, this year, actually, some company uh, opened uh, the, some kind of the wearable electronics, such as Google Glasses and Samsung the, the watch type, the, the cell phone and health monitoring systems as well. Uh, uh, however, if you look at the detail of these devices, actually, the device, devices are still the bulk and solid, but they made the devices as small as possible, and then they placed the devices on the, the, some kind of the wearable tool, such as glass and watches. Uh, in my uh, these are the great improvement and also the de development uh, to uh, to realize the, the future wearable electronics. However, in my opinion, these are the still not the, the truly the wearable devices. Uh, wearable devices must be like a clothes and should be placed on a human without any feelings. So, if we can realize truly the wearable devices, there are the wide range of the applications. Uh, especially uh, my research focuses on the health monitoring systems. I would like to show you two examples here. So for the first one is for the elder person or patient. So they usually make an appointment to see a doctor, and then they take a bus, train, or taxi to go to the hospital. And it sounds like this process are easy, but for the older, elder person, this, these are the not so easy process. And then they can finally the, check their health condition to, uh, by seeing the doctor. And also for doctors, they also need to see uh, tens of the patients in a day. That, that also the hard uh, work for the doctors, and also it's very hard for doctors to remember the, the, the detail of the, the each uh, patient's condition. The another another example is for the diabetic patients. So they usually check their glucose level by taking the blood from uh, their fingertips, and then they take a note and, of the glucose level as well as the health conditions. And then they need to do the insulin shot by themselves. So this is kind of the dangerous process since they use the needle penetrating to the human bodies. So if we can realize the, if we can realize the, the wireless wearable system, that can probably replace this process. So to realize that, so we propose to demonstrate the smart bondage, what we call the human interactive electronics. Uh, as you can see this image. So I would like to explain a little bit about this. So first, uh, the smart bandage can sense the, the human health condition. And if the device thinks that the human health condition is not right, then the, the device can decide to deliver the, the drug into the human body, as an example. Of course, uh, by, in, uh, by integrating the flexible display, so patients can check the, their health condition as real time. And also by putting the, the wireless system, we can also send the, the diagnostic result to the doctor via cell phones. So that doctor can check the patient the health condition without seeing a doctor, uh, the, without seeing the patients. That can also, uh, that process helps the doctors as well, so that the doctor can focus on the, the urgent patient who come to the uh, hospital. And also a doctor can control the, the drug delivery system uh, through the cell phone to inject the, the drug into the human body. Or a doctor can request a patient to come to uh, the hospital to see a doctor. So to realize this kind of the wearable devices, uh, what, the, what, what are the bottlenecks and challenges? The answer is very simple. The conventional device is not flexible. So unfortunately, devices are usually made by solid material on the right side of the picture. However, if you look at the, uh, however, if you think about our, the, uh, the clothes, of course, that is uh, very flexible and affordable. So by, uh, if we want to realize the wearable devices, we need to uh, make uh, the electronic material on the flexible substrate. The another key challenge is, to, is that the, the device must be the low cost since we don't want to pay the, the device for uh, uh, too much. And also the device must be low power consumption since we don't want to bring the large battery with you. And the another importance is that the device must be comfortable and convenient for human life. And also the design must be attractive for human. So since I am an engineer, so I'm, my research focuses on these three topics. 
So uh, to realize the, the electronic material on the flexible substrate, so uh, we, are, uh, we are proposing the cost-effective printing techniques, like a printer, you print out the paper. But here, instead of the ink, uh, we use the, the nanomaterial, uh, nanomaterial onto the flexible substrate. So I don't want to talk about the detail of this technique, but uh, I would like to show you two examples here. So like uh, we use the roller or the like ink, so we can uh, form the, the nanomaterial film onto the, any kind of substrate, such as glass, paper, uh, plastic, and fabric as well. So also the, by in, uh, developing the, the different type of printing techniques, we can also integrate different type of nanomaterial systems. That means we can integrate different type of devices, such as sensor, actuator, and circuit as well. So again, the advantage of this technique is we can uh, you, we can uh, realize the macro scale fabrication with low cost, and also we can choose a variety of substrates such as plastic, paper, and the fabric. And then by using the, the, the printed nanomaterial film, so we, we can fabricate the devices. So here the, we uh, demonstrate the, the first proof of concept smart bandage. So here the, the device has a touch sensor arrays for the touch panel, and also we integrate the wireless coil to detect the that touch wirelessly and also temperature. And, and for the curing system, we, we also integrate the, the drug de delivery pump. And then so this picture shows the, the final structure we fabricate. Uh, still, the device looks miserable, but uh, this is kind of research level, so uh, research level. And then so since we are using the printing technique on the flexible substrate, so we can easily place the devices on the human body without breaking the devices. And also, uh, if we want to uh, deliver the drug, we can also eject the drug or water through the pump. And then we also characterize the, the, the device with the wireless detection. So actually by touching the device, so we can detect the, the signal from the wireless the receiver coil. And also, we place this device on the human body, and then we also monitor the real time the, the surface skin temperature uh, during the lunch with spicy soup and exercise as well. So since uh, this is a still the ongoing project, so we still need to do a lot of things to realize the smart bandage, as I explained before. Uh, now that we are developing the different type of sensors, such as the heart beat and temperature, and also the, as a drug delivery system, we are developing the, the painless needle and drug delivery system pump. And as a system, we also integrate in flexible display, wireless coil, and circuit as well. So hopefully we can uh, realize the, the, the truly the wearable electronics uh, wirelessly. Uh, as you can see the, the image. So I would like to summarize my talk so today. So uh, I introduced some of the, the wearable devices using the, the developed printing techniques. And then, so as a proof of concept, the, we developed a smart bandage, but still this is a prototype, so we, we still need to do a lot of things, such as the study of the interface between human and the devices, and also design must be that improved. And also we need to add more functionality for the health monitoring systems. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cooney. And now over to Duncan. Okay. Hello. Hi. So, hi. Uh, my name is Duncan, and uh, I'm a uh, co founder and director at Vitamins. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary design and invention studio, uh, and this is our studio in Spitalfields here in London. Now, we work in a, a deliberately wide field, and we're very multidisciplinary in everything that we do, and, and we cover all sorts of different areas in, in our practice, uh, things as broad as architecture to electronics through to engineering or fashion or even magic. Now, through everything that we design and, and, and by working across this wide uh, field, um, we're often trying to do a lot of what uh, Simon mentioned this morning, actually, which is trying to get that essence of magic of a new innovation out to people who can experience it, but trying to avoid any risk of it being seen in a bad way. And 
one of the ways that we try to do this is we try to make sure that everything we design meets these four values. We try to make things that are unexpected, that they you know, should raise eyebrows when people see them or experience them, that are deeply relevant. So uh, our designs are always uh, trying to meet a, a real need or founded on, on some sort of firm research. Um, we try to make our designs elegant. You know, we, we try not to over-engineer or pile too much design on a solution of a, pro of a problem, but to try to get an elegant solution to it. Um, and we also try to make things that are full of wonder. You know, we try to get a little bit of a, a wow out of that experience each time. Now, one of our favorite ways of doing this is to make a really good use of a, a really powerful and great technology within a design, um, but then to also, very importantly, make that technology vanish so that the focus is not on the technology itself. You just have the, uh, the design and the experience left for the user to, to use. So, for, as an example, um, we were approached by Nokia and Burton Snowboarding uh, to try and develop some new technologies to add something new to this experience, to this sport. And the very first thing that we did was that we just launched into uh, a month of making as many sensors as we possibly could. And the main reason we did this was that we wanted to try and have them all there to cherry pick from and then to eliminate. You know, we wanted to pick which were the ones that actually were going to contribute to this experience, not be too focused on just the technology. So we had bend sensors in clothing, watching the undulation of, of ground going past a moving object. Um, we were looking at uh, body temperature and heart rate uh, actual speed versus perceived wind speed. Um, we were also looking at uh, even uh, galvanic skin response, you know, almost like a wearable lie detector. Um, and we just tried to, to assemble a, uh, you know, almost like an artist palette of technologies that we could then pick from. And we tested them. We just made them and tested them as quick as possible. And, you know, this was one of our favorites that never made the cut. Um, you can very accurately measure how fast snow is going past the bottom of a snowboard by using an optical mouse with a window cut in the, in the bottom of a baking tray. Um, this works perfectly up to a maximum speed of five miles per hour, but after that, it's useless. But, you know, it, 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 serves the, the, you know, it shows the point that we were trying to just establish what was possible before designing. So we went on to create a set of wearable Bluetooth sensors. Uh, these were all uh, in parallel uh, syncing data to an app uh, on a smartphone. And then we, we created software to create a data visualization, which I can show you quickly here. So uh, this guy's a uh, Olympic um, silver medalist. And he's uh, competing in the uh, US Open here. And He's wearing five of our wearable sensors, uh, and, and very importantly, you know, he's, he's unaware that he's wearing them. You know, they're, they're just there, and he can just focus on doing his thing, you know, taking part in the, in the performance. But you can see there that we're, we're logging uh, his speed, his heart rate. Uh, the third sen uh, sensor reading there is rush, we called it, but yeah, it's essentially it's this galvanic skin response. And you can see there it's a, it's a, it's a reading that peaks at about sort of 70 or 80 every time he's in the air. Um, but then because he's a pro, it comes right back down to about 20 just before he does the next jump. When we tried this out on amateurs, when that thing went up high, it stayed high for the rest of the day. You can see how much his board is twisting left and right, you know, how nervous and in control is he. And also the pressure in his feet. So you can see if he's leaning on his toes, his heels, his front leg or his rear leg. Um, and this was just really interesting. It gave us a, you know, a whole new insight. But um, essentially, you know, the most important thing was that for him, he had no idea he was wearing it. He could just get on and do the sport. Now, in the world of wheelchairs, uh, there's actually you know, a really great focus on how technology can empower, enable, and inspire, and, and this is fantastic. But what about when you need to you take a wheelchair traveling, or when you need to store a chair at home, or get it in the boot of a small car? Um, you know, what, what about the times when you want to make this technology disappear? Well, some of these issues have been addressed very well within the designs of the chair itself, but actually the core technology of a wheelchair, you know, the wheel, the biggest part, um, it hasn't been tackled at all. So even um, folding wheelchairs, they're often bulky, fragile, and, and almost impossible to travel with. So, of course, people say, don't try and reinvent the wheel, but why not? You know, it's just a, it's a light, strong circle with a tire on it. So why not make it fold away so that your entire wheelchair can fit into a small storage compartment? It can fit into a bag, the boot of a small car, or an overhead locker on a flight. Um, so perhaps we can experiment. Perhaps we can develop something to do this. You know? and, and again, you know, making and experimenting, just, just making these things real and stepping through the iterations, you can start to edge towards something that solves that problem. 
Um, so here you can see a whole sort of range of different things from sort of rough mock-ups through to engineering mock-ups through to rapid prototypes. Uh, again, sort of more, more highly developed engineering prototypes and then the actual final product. So this is the Morph folding wheel. Um, it's, it's a real product now. It's, it's, out the, uh, it's been on sale since uh, February. And, and with this product, you can do these things. You know, it's a tool that fills in the last missing piece of what, uh, you know, what a, 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 a wheelchair is, you know, which is, in effect is you know, a very large piece of wearable technology. Um, and uh, this, this product has uh, is won uh, the transport category of the design of the year this year, and, and last week just picked up product design of the year in the Icon Magazine Awards. Um, but more than anything, um, what's really fantastic is now this product's out there being used, people are coming back with more and more new ways that they're using it to make that technology fit better into their lives. They can get taxis when they couldn't have got them before. They can go to places they couldn't go to before. They can get an extra chair when they didn't have space before. All of these things. The final thing I just want to show you is how we had a look at trying to reinvent the humble blood pressure monitor. Um, I, was, I was happy to see it up on those uh, earlier slides just now. Now, in the UK, 350 people a day have a preventable stroke or heart attack, and, and the Blood Pressure Association um, uh, state that it's the, it's the biggest known cause of disability and premature uh, death in the UK. But monitoring blood pressure is also a really, really great uh, metric for keeping a, a tab on all sorts of different conditions. So you know, what does a blood pressure monitor look like? Well, you know, typically it's something like this. Now, the problem here is that this, this, uh, this piece of healthcare uh, monitoring equipment has clearly been designed to be medical, to look medical. Uh, it's designed to sit on a, on a stainless steel table in, in a clinic somewhere. Um, I mean, how, how well does this fit into life in general? Well, the answer is not very well. So we started on this project looking at what people carry around with them every day. I mean, this is a thing. You need to, you need to use this once or twice a day. So um, we found that people have makeup, mobile phones, magazines, tablets. Uh, they have glasses cases. They have laptops. And they have notebooks, cards, pens. Now, these objects, we started to realize, they all have this sort of calm aesthetic and beauty to them. They're, they're really universal. Um, they fit in absolutely anywhere and with absolutely anyone. And, and we realized this is the ecosystem that a product like a blood pressure monitor has to fit in, into. So what we designed was this, the cardio arm blood pressure monitor. So it's the first medically approved wireless tubeless blood pressure monitor. That, most importantly, doesn't look like a blood pressure monitor. And to use it, all you do is you simply unwrap the device uh, and place it over your arm. There are absolutely no buttons or readouts, no medical colors. There's nothing to help induce white coat syndrome uh, that might affect the results. Uh, it even turns on automatically as you unwrap it. Then all you do is you press go on your smartphone and the app takes care of the rest, even recording the data for you or your doctor to look at later. Now, there's some really powerful technology in there that, that, that you know, is, is, is available to be used in these sorts of products. But what we've tried to do with this design is to make that technology completely disappear. It, it's become an object, not a technological device anymore. And hopefully, that it will fit ex perfectly into your existing lifestyle. So hopefully, you didn't spot it earlier when I showed you this image here, or here, or here. So when we talk about wearable healthcare products, then the design's gonna have to be driven by sound, exciting technology, and, and they're gonna have to be designed to disappear and blend perfectly into the routines and experiences of everyday life. And so it's a really, really great area to apply this, this sort of, this approach of using really great technology, but trying to make it vanish, trying to make it fit seamlessly. Um, so if these products can be um, unexpected, deeply relevant, elegant, and full of wonder, then I think they stand a really good chance that people will use them, actually use them, and benefit from them and enjoy a healthier and happier life as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And now over to Gary, our last speaker. Hello. 
Um, so I'm, I've been working uh, since about April um, on a project uh, we're based up in Edinburgh. It's called Lightlog. Um, the idea kicked off as a hack weekend um, uh, back in April, where we spent 48 hours um, with a, a, a team called Project Ginsberg um, and New Media Scotland, um, where we were trying to find uh, solutions for mental wellness um, and mental health. Um, the Um, the idea that came out of that hat weekend um, for me was to um, to try to build a small light logging device um, that would constantly record ambient light um, and provide information for people who suffer with seasonal affective disorder or winter blues. Um, it's not specifically de designed for people who are interested in quantified self, um, but obviously if you like logging data, there's a lot of data in here. Um, and if you've not noticed, outside it's getting pretty dark. Um, so December 21st, where we'll head to pretty soon, um, we're already down to um, about seven hours up in Edinburgh, um, and we'll get down as low as uh, eight hours um, down here in London. Um, when we first uh, started running through the various research articles, um, I collect all the papers and generate a, a self-organizing map to try to get an overview of where the interesting data is. Um, so light therapy, um, uh, there's some interesting data here on uh, serotonin levels um, and the effects that you get uh, when you're exposed to light. Um, you also have uh, uh, issues with melatonin levels so that when you don't have enough light, uh, melatonin is produced and that makes you sleepy and tired which can lead to depression over the long term. And out of the research, I think one of the most uh, interesting little snippets which came out again and again when you looked at different research topics, um, if you disrupt the, your circadian rhythm, um, it does have quite serious effects long term on, on your health. And that's everything from your immune system um, to uh, uh, triggers for cancer, um, lots, of, lots of nasty things. Uh, Shift work, especially if you're on a rotating shift work, can be very hazardous to your health. Um, one of the things that came out quite nicely, again, in one of those papers, um, there's very good uh, studies which show that you can actually shift your sleep phase by uh, exposure to bright light at certain times of the day. So if you have bright light before you go to bed, you actually push your phase into, into the future. Um, and if you have bright light uh, when you wake up, you're pulling your phase back again. Um, the interesting thing is we're all actually half an hour uh, incorrect. Our, our body clocks are actually 24 and a half hours. Um, and we're using, our, our bodies are using uh, the natural light cycle to try to keep that in sync. And so you, in a normal case, you would have a balance of bright light and dark darkness before you go to sleep. And that would keep you in sync. Uh, and keep your um, metabolism, metabolism and your hormones in, in a good cycle. What I've done here is just created um, a, a volume map of uh, various levels of lux that you would need to record. Um, so direct sunlight, you can see, is a, a magnet, many magnitudes uh, greater uh, than the other ones here on the chart. Um, you, for light therapy, you need 2,000 to uh, 10,000 lux. Um, those are these little light boxes that you get to sit in front of. Um, if, you, if you've only got a box that does, say, 2,500, you're probably having to sit there for maybe an hour in the morning to get your dose up. Um, if, if you have a 10,000 one, you, you can probably do it in about half an hour. Um, and people find that when they're using the, um, the light boxes, it usually takes four to five days of treatment before you start to have an effect. Um, and in the same way, if, if you're coming into winter or maybe there's been a run of bad weather um, and so the, you know, it's been cloudy, there's not been that much sun, you can, <clears throat> you can find that um, it takes, again, three or four days for someone to notice that they might need to top up their light levels. Um, Looking, looking down here, you can see the range. So the, so the wearable device needs to record um, this kind of range of light. Um, I'm actually wearing a, a prototype here that's blinking away. Um, 
It will cover, um, I've tested this up to, up to 100,000 lux, which is a bright sun on a strong sunny day, outdoors, blue sky, no haze. Um, and that was, I think, in uh, August, September. Um, we're down, even if you stand outside now with the sunlight streaming onto, onto you, you're down to about uh, 60,000 uh, lux um, at best. So we're already, uh, because of winter, we're already down quite a bit. Uh, the other thing that's useful to record um, is color. Um, so again, this, this is recording uh, just the, the, the total lux level and also the, the color balance in the light. The, the two aspects that you measure, there's two dimensions. So you have um, uh, color temperature uh, and you have color tint. Um, color temperature is uh, based on black body radiation. Um, it goes from uh, match flames uh, all the way up to a clear blue sky. Um, the research shows that if you're, um, the, the best kind of light to have is actually at the shorter frequencies, which is up at the blue end of the spectrum, uh, which is why outdoors is a very good source of the type of light uh, that you need. Um, the, the gas, uh, the gas em emission light lighting, um, that's light that's produced by, um, uh, produced in a gas, and because of the absorption patterns of a gas, you end up with a green magenta tint to light. So it, it, when you take photos, most of the time, your color ba balance is having to work against this. You know, are you indoors, are you outdoors, is it cloudy, are you in a shadow? And that's temperature that usually has to be tweaked. Um, and unless you're using a uh, strange type of fluorescent lighting indoors, you generally don't have to worry too much about color tint. So uh, as part of the, the project, um, this is some of the brainstorming I was doing uh, on the, uh, the type of enclosure and the type of uh, displays uh, that we'd want to present people. Um, one of the problems uh, with, with technology at the moment is if you want low power, long life systems, you need to have Bluetooth LE4 compatible devices. Um, the market penetration is not good at the moment. It's great if you're a real technophile, um, because if you've got a new phone, new PC in the last couple of years, it'll be supported. But a lot of the people that um, I've been meeting don't have this type of technology. You know, if they're lucky, they have a, a smartphone, but usually it's just a feature phone. They're probably running an old version of an OS, an old version of some operating system. So trying to get technology to the people who actually need it is actually quite a, quite a challenge here. Um, we've also been looking at how do we share data. So um, one of the nice things is the, the data is fairly, uh, uh, it doesn't contain much privacy sensitive information. Um, and so by allowing people to aggregate their data, you can actually see uh, where your data sits compared to someone else's. So you can actually get a feel uh, for, for, for how your data, how, how your version of life matches with somebody else. Uh, this is just a very quick breakdown of the types of technology inside. Very simple, a uh, PIC microprocessor, 64K of memory, um, three volt battery and some photo sensors. Uh, currently it's using a serial link, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, I've got a prototype with Bluetooth, but the power is a bit of an issue at the moment. Um, this will currently run for four months and record data for four, for four months. Um, here's some of the early prototypes. To get the color recording very early on, I had to use sweet wrappers. That, it was a 48-hour hack. I enjoyed the sweets, and it worked quite nicely. Um, and this is the one that I'm wearing at the moment. Um, so it's about 3.2 by 3.2 centimeters square, about one and a half centimeters deep. It needs to get smaller. Um, but as I said, this, this will run for four months and record four months' worth of data. The next step from this is uh, it's an open source project um, and it's all using through-hole technology, so it's solderable by hand. Um, I need to move to surface mount components and manufacture circuit boards to bring the size down. So this is the kind of data we actually see. Um, so this is just the RGB spectrum showing. Uh, if you look, it's a nice sort of gradual um, drift uh, from this side. So this is the morning rise. Uh, the, the, it, the, the unit is stationary, sitting on my bedside table, and this is the sun rising. The spikes is then when it's actually active. It's quite directional, so when you're wearing it and moving it around, you get spikes of, of activity. It's a bit boring to show people this. Um, so if, if you actually show it as real, true color, 
it's not that exciting. It's, um, you end up with porridge, porridge or mauve or brown or some kind of soupy color. So it's not very engaging. It's useful for looking at uh, color patterns. So you can see there was a blue tint to the morning rise on this particular day. So one of the things I was trying to do is use a full spectrum. You can actually scale your RGB colors to match a color spectrum, so you're, you're, you're getting a more engaging graphic. Uh, that even if you've got boring data, it's still nice to look at. OK, and here's a couple of, uh, so this is three days from last week. Um, you can see November the 29th was very dull and gray. Um, but we have quite nice spikes, so that um, the, the peaks that you're seeing in this uh, is just after midday, uh, and it's about, uh, uh, about 100 lux, uh, sorry, about 100,000 lux. Um, so these are good, dose, good doses. Um, and if we zoom in just there, um, here we go. So this particular peak, which was on the uh, November the 30th, this shows uh, a good peak for an hour of over 50,000 lux, which is the kind of uh, record that you'd want to find um, if you were trying to manage uh, your own uh, light intake. Um, the hope is that by getting communities to help build these devices, um, making sure that it's open source, that the information is out there, and people, people can customize the casing and get engaged in the data, um, that people will be much more engaged with the practice of modifying their behaviors, maybe going outside for lunch to make sure they get some more sunlight, maybe getting up a bit earlier, maybe getting a desk near a window, um, just, just to try to get some extra light into their life. Um, Sunlight is what you want. If you, could, if you can get a little bit more sunlight, even if it's just half an hour or an hour, that makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And I think on that note, um, I better, you come and take my place. Um, on that note, I think it's a good, good point to end, really, because um, I don't know, my, my first question was going to be, you, given when the the pharmaceutical industry, the drugs companies, already have quite a challenge in terms of people engaging with the existing technology, uh, i.e. drugs, uh, starting to use them and then seeing them all the way through. And these are things that supposedly help them and help them get better. So I suppose my first question to the panel is, what do you think is going to really get people interested in this kind of wearable technology in terms of better health and what's going to get people engaged? And Perhaps, Gary, we can start with you. Well, so the, um, the, the things that I've looked at is, is low cost. Um, so all of the parts uh, for this are under 10 pounds. Um, so it takes about an hour to put to hand solder one together. Um, so there is time involved there. But if you're engaging with someone to make the device, so if you get someone to sit down and you show them how to make it or you provide them video of how to, how to put the th device together. Um, it's something they can access. It's something they can build and customize for themselves. Um, and it's also about, um, I'm, I'm trying to leave the design of the case open. So there will be a, a case designed for the unit. Um, but I'm trying to engage uh, jewelers uh, and other makers um, to get involved in the design so that people can personalize the device. It, I can't make it invisible. It would be nice if it was invisible, but because you're logging light, it needs to be worn somewhere uh, on the outside of your body. So it's going to be jewelry-like um, or neutral that people don't mind wearing it. And they, they need to buy into um, engaging with their data in that way. What does the rest of the panel think? Hello? Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that, actually. It's, it's a good approach, especially for some of these new um, new wearables. And you know, if obviously one motivating factor is always you want to get an immediate um, benefit out of wearing one of these things. But um, that's where something like logging, some, logging light is, you know, you're not going to wear that for one day and get an immediate benefit. You want to integrate it into your lifestyle and you're going to see the benefit further down the line. Um, and in that respect, yeah, I mean, it, it's a great approach to take, you know, if, if you could modularize the, the part that, um, that, 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 does, that does the job and let people choose their own styles. I mean, we've got three people wearing glasses here and look how different each of your pairs of glasses are. But they've all got lenses. So if you can make the lenses 
um, let other people, you know, jewelry designers, fashion designers, um, people making it for themselves, you know, let them design around and integrate it into their lifestyles, then um, that's, you know, that could be really interesting. Yeah, I think I just agree with that point because I think it's almost, um, for me, the point of view that I have is the idea of it's, if it can be made as effortless and formless as possible. So I, you can kind of put yourself forward and think, well, exactly, how, like, these boards are going to shrink to a certain point, and that's a technological engineering point of view. But when that happens, it's the, it's the, the intention of finding a way to sort of just let people let it sit completely invisibly that um, makes it not so much of an overt uh, activity, and it just becomes a, a, a way of dealing with things. So. For example, I mean, one of the big things I'm interested in is breathing. So we all suffer from really bad breathing, and it's a very hard thing to try and convert into, like, like light, it's a really difficult thing to try and convert into a tangible experience. And so it's just about building languages that can deal with this and then making it as uh, uh, formless as possible so people can just sort of take it in and uh, make it a part of their lives. And, um, Cooney, you talked about how the... Uh, the smart plaster will be sort of sending data to to doctors and clinicians looking after people. I just wondered, from your point of view, if you could, um, you know, and for the rest of the panel also, you know, how is this kind of the potential of this kind of technology going to change the relationship between patient and, and doctor? And what do we need to take into account when we're designing around that? Uh, I think the, the most important thing is to realize that I mean, the, the reliability is the, the everything for the health monitoring, the medical systems. So, but uh, if, we, if we make uh, the wearable devices, so we need to sacrifice uh, some of the technology for, uh, compared to the conventional devices. So I don't know how to do that, but uh, we need to consider the reliability of the devices to realize uh, the wearable devices for the future. What do other people think about the, the, the relationship with, with, with uh, with doctors and clinicians, because sooner or later, if this data is to be of any value, you're going to be talking to your doctor about it. I mean, uh, I'm not a medical person, so you can shoot me down. But like, it's kind of for me, it feels like uh, a lot of this is. I mean, for yeah, the, the, when you can gather large amounts of data, you can you can uh, understand the the bigger picture, which is kind of never really. It's kind of a new idea in terms of Western medicine that we can actually kind of chart over time, scientifically, kind of accurately, the sort of the effects of blood pressure or uh, uh, oxygen in the blood or, or your, uh, the, the ECG patterns. Like it's, it's super new and I, I think it's kind of, it's an unanswered question that I think um, maybe medical companies have an idea of how they want to do it, but then it's different systems around different parts of the world. So the Americans will have a different approach because it fits into their health system around insurance where the kind of the, the the sort of anxious thought is that medical companies, insurance companies will have that data and use it against you. Whereas what we can really, if we can try and be optimistic about it, we can understand it as being uh, using these telltale signs to sort of prevent illnesses before they happen, which is exactly the same with the light levels. That uh, that seems to be, I'd, I'd like to be optimistic about how we can actually use all that sort of breadth of data um, to sort of our advantage on a, on a personal level. I think it's also about, edu it's about ed education at that point of view as well, so that people can understand the effects that certain things have on their lives without having to think about the, the medical point of it. So, so, so bre breathing or, or light is a very sort of very tangible thing that we all deal with, uh, but we don't necessarily understand the implications of. And that's super important to think about. I, th I think as well, um, there's, there's there's definitely challenges ahead, but it, it is really exciting for uh, the way that these these new emerging technologies uh, and existing ones can change the patient-doctor relationship. Uh, another project we've worked on recently is, is a, uh, a, a medical ECG, which you can just wear all the time um, very easily. Um, so it's, it's, it's like one of these heart rate monitors you'd wear to the gym, but it's actually taking a full medical ECG. Now, looking into that project, it was really sort of you suddenly become a bit astounded uh, to realize that the technology to allow this to happen does exist. But if you have a, uh, a heart issue uh, and you go to your doctor, they will stick this, uh, this uh, ECG recorder on you and, and tell you to go away. 
have your ECG recorded for one or two days, and you then deliver it back through a letterbox at the hospital. And it's literally a shot in the dark. Um, you don't know if the issue you had, you had is going to be happening at that time. Maybe it only occurs every, every month or so. Um, you also, you don't even, as a patient, you don't even know if it's worked. You don't know if the battery ran out. Um, and and it's, real, it's a real sort of pot shop approach. You know, one, one visit, one measurement, um, send it back, find out a week later what the results were. So just the, the concept of continuous monitoring, a bit of transparency and understanding for the patient, and then uh, also greater understanding for the, the doctor is, is amazing. Um, but lots more data, and you've got to keep it, you've got to interpret it correctly, not get overwhelmed with it, and uh, keep it secure. Thanks very much. And I think, do we have time for a couple of questions? <coughs> Unfortunately not, but uh, thanks very much to the panel. Uh, we're just at a very interesting kind of, um, cusp of, of what this te technology started to do and we've seen some real life examples of that and some very thought-provoking uh, insights into designing around this area so I'd like to thank the panel thank you very much